Welcome to the Young Entrepreneur's Journey with your host, Yasmina Ellens. Welcome to the Young Entrepreneur's Journey, where we take the skills, mindset, and attitude needed to achieve any entrepreneurial endeavor, whether you're just starting out or you're already on your journey. And now, our host, Yasmina Ellens. Hello and welcome back to the Young Entrepreneur's Journey podcast with your host, Yasmina Ellens. Now, today I have the absolute pleasure of chatting with powerhouse Elizabeth Frisch, who is the founder and CEO of The Thrival Company. She started her career as a chemical engineer and then cross-trained into psychology, business performance, auditing, organizational culture, and individual behavior change, and all of these really interesting nerdy business and psychological topics. Now, after the birth of her first child, she had the epiphany that you can't engineer a human. And she has spent 25 years sharing what she has learned with organizational leaders with the understanding that you cannot neglect the human side of engineering successful companies. Now, Elizabeth has worked with everyone from Fortune 500 companies to VC and private equity firms to government agencies, nonprofit organizations, and even the U.S. military. She is also the best-selling author of the book Mission to Millions, which seeks to inspire people to make their big ideas a reality. And she's also very excited for her upcoming book release this year of You Can't Engineer Human. Now, by the end of this interview, you will have a strong understanding of how to bring the best out of high performers. You will gain an insight into how you can turn your big idea into a reality, and you will feel inspired to go out and take on the world with your business. Thank you so much for coming on today, Elizabeth. It's an absolute pleasure. Oh, and I'm so enjoying getting to be here and do this. Uh, One thing I love about the technology now is we can talk from anywhere on the planet. So great to be with you. Exactly. Yeah. Texas, London, it's like there's no distance between us at all. No, and I'm missing Europe right now. I had some trips planned that I'm hoping to get done next year instead of this year. Hey, come 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 summer or late this year, you'll be we'll be all over Europe. I miss <laughs> oh. Um so my first question for you, Elizabeth, is what originally got you onto your entrepreneurial journey? I jokingly referred uh, to myself as a serial job lever. Like every two to three years, I would change jobs. And I was looking at everybody else who was happy. They would stay. They would put down their roots. And I just felt very um, limited. You know, I'd get to two or three years. I'd have mastered whatever was the job I hired in for. And one of the flaws of corporate America that I do work with corporations on now is that they kind of, if you're really good at something, they want to keep you there. Well, that's like the antithesis of the entrepreneurial spirit, right? Most entrepreneurs are on the builder side, right? And once they build it, get it structured, they're ready to hand it off and they need a new opportunity. And so um, after my third or fourth job of missing, um, you know, going like, why am I leaving this job after three years and making myself wrong for it? I was like, I was pregnant and I had a good transition and a good excuse. And I was like, well, maybe I should just do my own company. You know, Um, I was always working for all these big companies, you know, in a bunch of different roles. But I was like, well, what would it look like if I just did my own company? And my employer said, we can't let you telework. You're too important to this job you're in. And I was like, I have a kid coming. You know, I was pretty, you know, all those good things that come with that. And I was like, well, Maybe it's time for me to look at doing something on my own because back then there was no, like telework was, you just didn't telework, right? It was considered, you can't do a job, you can't be a consultant. And I was on the fence and I'm one of those people, entrepreneurs, some of you on this phone call understand this, uh, this podcast understand this is uh, the person, my big, big, big boss said to me, you can't be successful being a consultant and working from home. Hmm. Anytime anybody tells me it's not possible, I'm like, all right, time to prove them wrong, you know, because I was like, "Mm, I don't like you telling me no. So that was the thing that was like, okay, you're definitely an entrepreneur because your job, like my whole thrill is taking the impossible and making it possible. Like every client who comes to me with a problem, I'm always like, got it. We're going to figure it out. 
And they're always like, what do you mean? How do you know? And I'm like, well, 28 years of doing it, but I just know that impossible. I loved Audrey Hepburn's quote. Impossible is not impossible. It's I am possible. And so the minute I hear impossible, my, I get my attention going and I'm like, I want to solve that. Mm. And so how do you do that? How do you, how do you, cause obviously many entrepreneurs or sort of closeted entrepreneurs, they'll have this really big idea and, mm-hmm. and they, they, they'll think, oh, it's something out of this world. You know, something I always like to think is, you know, life and business, it's a team sport. If you can't, um, people way smarter than me have said, you know, if you can accomplish your goals on your own, they're, they're too small. Right. So you might have this like really big grand idea and you're like, oh, this would be so amazing. But many ideas, like most ideas just stay ideas and they die and they don't become innovations. They don't become executed. They don't actually make a change in the world. So how do you make the impossible possible? Um, One of the things that I talk about it in my first book is um, the true entrepreneurs who make big ideas happen. We we have a characteristic, a characteristic and it's called anchoring. So when we have an idea, it never stays in our head. It gets written down. It gets put on a map. We break it apart. We analyze it and we anchor it, basically. And I talk about that in the book is depending on how you were raised, it can be cultural and it could be your work culture. It could be your home culture. It could be your societal culture you're raised in. Most cultures tend to tamp down on our ideas from a very young age. Right. So when I was a child, my mother, I came from a really controlled, strict, disciplined family, and I was always coming up with the crazy stuff. Right. Um, But as as a kid, you know, I was like, even then I, I knew there was some kind of power to like writing it down and working it and not getting hooked on deadlines. And so the other thing that people tend to do is they want to do something and they put this artificial deadline on it. Like, I'm going to launch a billion dollar company in 12 months. Well, if you've never made a billion dollars before, your psyche and your structure and your even way of living is not aligned with a billion dollars. And so making sure, and I always say your step one is to just start capturing every idea you have just for a week and then start prioritizing those ideas every Sunday and then putting at least five minutes of effort on them because the way the brain works and um, having to now done years and years of study about the brain is even five minutes of action on a goal or an idea will deliver further momentum that your brain keeps working on it when you're awake, when you're asleep, whatever, and it keeps your little radar 360 so that when an opportunity comes up to jump on this or that, you can do it. And one of the things that we allow other people to do is make our priorities, make our days, make our circumstances. Um, And I have like inviolate time now in the morning where it's like, I write my goals, I write my top 10 to do's and I decide. And if something comes in unexpected, I'll evaluate. But, you know, if you look, I have now seven journals of big ideas sitting on my shelf because every day and every year and every quarter and every month, I literally retick and reconnect with my big ideas. And then I like, sometimes I, I have one idea I thought it was gonna take me a year to do. All right, I'm on year four. I don't care, the payback's huge. Still getting it done is gonna be massively um, supportive to me and my company and my family and financially and all those other good things. So. Another part of it is not just the anchoring, but the patience with yourself and others. The minute you define something as it has to be done and it's a failure if it's not done, those are the people who quit. If you look at anybody, any of the great inventors, it was trial and error, trial and error, trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. error. You know, nobody's a, you know overnight movie star (laughs) you know they didn't just get discovered and suddenly it was great there's always steps they took to be and get it done and it just looks like it happened fast Mm, definitely so it's it's basically all about trusting the process because i think we've right Mm -hmm. i think we've all been there where it's like you're like i'm gonna get this done by this date and like you're in this 
your brain is in this state where it's super motivated and super hyped and it thinks it can do anything and it, it thinks it can climb Everest in a day yeah. <laughs> and it obviously it obviously can't yeah. um and so I think we've all experienced that kind of frustration and that like uh and then then when it when it reality doesn't match your expectations you can just think well, i'm gonna give up now because you just yeah and i think on your side of the ocean a very famous person once said never ever 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 give up right mm. <laughs> and it's that's the truth of it because if you let your brain you know like the brain's three parts you got the part that keeps your blood breathing you have your blood oxygenated you breathing you know no, none of us really worry about it till it stops working right then we go to the hospital and then we have that part of the brain, which is survival. And then we have the part of the brain that's uniquely human, right? That gives us language and possibility and strategy and all those things. And our limbic brain literally records pain. And so if you associate every failure, every slowdown, everything with pain, guess what happens? You quit, you withdraw. Hmm. And so I, you know, I've been blessed to get to study under some of the most amazing mind masters, as well as just study the brain. And, you know, my kids were my human guinea pig when I realized that despite how many books I read before they were born, that they were going to write their own book on how to be parented and it's successful, <laughs> um, that every person's unique. And to, to the point of we all love to be solopreneurs, never happens your big idea doesn't happen as a solo. And, and that's the other thing that I think was the hardest thing is when you're a super competent person, which most entrepreneurs are, we can through grit and force and fighting it out, get a lot of stuff done, but then we a meteoric rise is a meteoric burnout because you can't sustain that. Nobody on the planet has that level of energy. So you got to get that team behind you. Hmm. And how do you do that? How do you get the the right team of people for that idea who are excited about it, who are motivated to work under you to actually make it happen? Yeah, team, you know, it's funny as an engineer, and I've been accused of being very spockish, I would only involve people who were like me originally. That's another flaw. Our brain wants us to surround ourselves by people who we like. So first mistake number one to avoid folks is if you're only working with people that you totally get along with and jive with, you're probably not having a good team, right? So I'll give you the negative side first. The best way to get a team is when you're clear on what your goals are. So let's put it this way. I'll, I'll give one of my goals. Like I had a, I have a goal to host the largest environmental health and pandemic safety virtual conference in May, right? And I'm an engineer and there's a certain way I would host that. But because I know that I have to find win-win people who don't have my personality type, because y'all need to realize your type, the way you read things, the way you understand things, there's like eight facets that make us each kind of uniquely human and the most simplistic thing. You, we, and we only like to hang out with the ones who are most like us. The other skills are missing then. If you don't have people who would like point out the fatal flaw in your idea. If you don't have, like, if you don't, if, you know, look at this background, you know, my office, very visual, this would make an auditory crazy, right? So how would you, you have to write someone who can write copy for all types of readers and learners, not just me who loves to talk with their hands, right? So to pick the right team, I'll give you three things. Number one, it's more important who they are being than what they have capability to do. And Dr. Barry Morgan, one of my dear friends, um, made it really simple. And I'm going to share his words of wisdom with you. He's with Energy for Success. He said, there's four types of people on the planet, right? If you're going to build a team, there's win-win people. Those are just the ones like, you all know them. We all go out there and like, no matter what you throw out there, they're behind you 100%. They get it done, right? Don't backstab, nothing like that. And then there's win-win people, but they need management. Like I jokingly say, I have a best friend, Scotty, and us being on time and getting to something, I have to manage her. It's not that she doesn't want to show up and have dinner, but we have really busy schedules and lives. So she's still win-win. We just have to do a little bit more work to get it to come out so we both win, right? And then there's the third category, which is, and we have so many of them in the workplace. They're like 20% of the workplace. They're win-lose people unconsciously. Their idea of winning is they win, and their idea of you winning is they win. So they don't think anything 
of any other viewpoint, right? They do crazy things like it's never their fault. They're always the victim. Someone else caused the breakdown. Like those people, I don't put on my team anymore. And when I identify them, if they're already on my team, I keep them in a very tight box with clear requirements, clear penalties and everything else because they, they can't, they're not even conscious that they're win-lose. And you, you know them because they're like, they're almost like the saboteurs of your big idea. Like you'll have relied on them for something and then it falls through and they'll have the excuse. They're like a country Western song here in the United States. Their dog died, their car broke down, right? Hmm. And then the one we all can recognize is because there's so many books. In fact, no, it's not on my shelf. There's one about how to handle assholes in the workplace. But category four, it's a game for them to win and everybody else lose. They love it. They're out for the hunt. They're out for the kill. They don't care who they take along with them. And you mm -hmm. want to like avoid those people at all costs. So when I look at my team, I'm like, I look at that criteria first. Then I look at what capabilities I need, because I know if I get a kick ass copywriter, but they're a toxic category four, that's not going to work. Or if I, you know, am trying to get an investment deal with a private equity company or a joint share, and they're literally like it's all racked in their favor and I have all the risk and they have all the reward. It doesn't matter. Money's, you know, we always are like, oh, my God, they're willing to give me two million dollars. Guess what? A toxic two million is worse than zero. Right. Because mm. then you're Definitely. missing finding the one that actually could help you. Yeah. Really powerful. I think one of the most important things when building a team is just to make sure that they're there to support the mission. They're the right kind of person. They're the right fit. You've got unique skill sets and that they're, they're not secretly trying to mess you up. I think yeah, it's. Yeah, because a lot of people are attracted to money and power. And those aren't good people. They're on it for the right. Like, if they're just in it for the money, guess what? Any entrepreneur on this call knows if you're just in it for the money, Prepare to be disappointed and fail at some point. If it's only money for you, you're not going to be the most successful people on the planet. The most successful entrepreneurs on the planet were had a bigger vision and mission that they held and people got behind. Definitely. And they mastered talking to people in their language, not their own. Exactly. You know? Again, again, mm -hmm. it's about that empathy, right? And that understanding of other people. And I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to dive more into that understanding of other people in a second. But before I do that, I'm really curious because earlier you mentioned about how you like to make the impossible possible. And people will come to you with an idea. They'd be like, Elizabeth, I don't know how to do this. This is, this is like, I don't know. This is, this is out of this world, you know? And you're like, oh, you know, we'll figure it out. Um, I'm wondering, are there any kind of creative processes that you go through when when looking at different ideas in particular and how people might think outside the box when they think something might not be possible yes now engineers of course we're always tasked like one of the things that we luck out in if you get an engineering degree like engineers have to build what's never been built right like we're given that thing so we're given this construct where we take the big problem or whatever it is and it goes right at the top and then, it, you know, I, you know, mind mapping would be the closest like corporate tool you could check out. Or um, there's another one called CAT, well, I use C-A-T-W-O-E, where you like literally take it and then you break it. So if you came up with like, I have a recent one, they're um, trying to revolutionize nursing to allow psych psychological teaching as part of their nursing curricula. Right. So most time nurses take professional development courses and they're all around patient care. But what about, you know, they're having nervous breakdowns during the pandemic. What about emotional resiliency? And so, you know, we took it at the top and said, OK, we're going to teach emotional resiliency to nurses. Right. And then you break it and say, OK, if everybody and I will just use the United States because this is where I am, if everybody in the United States had access to this course, what were all the pieces we need to allow that to happen? And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, you know, has to be online or delivered somehow virtually. It has to be affordable within a certain price constraint. It has to have buy-in from certain organizations because those have to be accredited credits, you know, certain. Or and so we have to have an organization that approves it. And then it, you start breaking it down and then you just keep rippling it till you get to the point where you have nothing else to solve for. 
Now, I would love to say the first time you do it, there's, you solve it all and it goes all the way to the bottom, but that's not how it works. But you do an initial solve for, right? Like one of the things entrepreneurs always do, and I always tell them don't quit your day job, is like they leave and go for it because there's two schools of thoughts out there. Some people are like, you can't, you know, you have to throw your focus into it or you're just, you know, picking away at it. You know, I had a group I worked with like that. I've never been of that viewpoint because when you put your criteria, so for an idea to happen, you have criteria, you have boundaries, you have benchmarks, you have by whens, right? Mm. One of my criteria was I'm not going to starve while I launch these companies or bootstrap these companies I've bootstrapped. Mm. So of course I didn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Did it slow down me launching? Uh, yeah, but on the other hand, I live in a really beautiful house in a really beautiful neighborhood. My family is well taken care of, you know, so th that's the other thing you have to remember is with any idea when you're breaking it down, like break it down to solve for it, but don't forget this part of it. Hmm. I'm not going to work 80 hours a week to do it anymore. I don't do that. Right. I don't, you know, there's a whole bunch of criteria you have to put in around yourself too. I'm not going to end up divorced because I've totally wedded myself and that's one thing I love about the millennials and the Gen Z. Um, naturally mm. better at those extra things that me as a Gen Xer really stunk at. So my mm. kids teach me to remember those things like, yeah, it's great. You just made X on this thing, but you haven't seen your kids in four weeks. So the other thing that's really nice about the new generation is, yeah, you can break it all down, start with a big thing, find all the facets, keep going down, keep going down, keep going down until you've got it all handled and it's a launch, right? But don't forget all those other facets around it called my health, my relationships, my, um, you know, doing it without giving myself an ulcer, stress, uh, all those kind of things. Really good ideas are encompass all of those things to make them happen. And then you have the joy of the journey. Because if you're not going to be happy till the end point, that's the other reason why entrepreneurs quit and burn out. You think mm -hmm. like, when I get to X, it's done. It doesn't work that way. And so when these companies come to me with the impossible, the first thing I do is, you know, I get them in the room and I'm like, well, why is it not possible? And a lot of times the things everybody says are not possible. It's cultural conversation and based on past history that only they know. So that's the other trick of our brains that every entrepreneur needs to catch. What is feasible and reasonable will can only by definition deliver the past. So when they come in the room and say, well, I'm a city government, like I was in a room doing a plan, they're like, we're a city government, we can't do X. And I said, well, you could do X if you change this rule. And they said, well, we can't change the rule. I said, yeah, you can. And they said, well, but it takes three years. And I said, okay, so three years to change this rule, then we go. So we're really looking at a 10 year plan for your idea, not a three. Well, 10 years is too long. And I said, what's too long, failure or 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. So the other thing, you know, when I work with these organizations around like what they're doing, we really have to define possible and impossible because depending on where they work, impossible is culturally defined. It's not based on real data. Hmm. It's based That's on our understanding or perceptions of time, space, and authority and power. Hmm. Well, you said so many interesting things there that I could I could unpack. I mean, the the first thing is that I think it's really interesting how you have almost this because obviously the brain is a question answering machine. So if you ask it a question, it's going to come up with an answer and you solve for the problem. And it's like almost like that design thinking approach of how can we this, how can we that test, retest. Yeah. And the scary things. thing is your brain is usually wrong with what it barfs it back at you. Yeah. That's why you have to have a team and you have to check and recheck your data and assumptions, you know, um, Elon Musk, and I'm going to just put a shout out to him. He's my new neighbor here in Austin, Texas. Um, he's a physics guy like me, right? We both came out of physics. And it, and to like when you say like the brain solves it, solves it, the brain thinks it's telling you what it's solved, but it may not know. And, and I love, do you mind if I do his four steps? Because I keep it right on my desk. So yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, so Elon Musk in physics. So hats off to you, my friend. So excited you're now in Austin. 
Identify your current challenge. Identify and define all your current underlying assumptions around that challenge. Find the root challenge. Like I do a whole course um, on analyzing the root cause because most of the time we fail as entrepreneurs because we're solving the wrong thing, right? Mm -hmm. And then number three is question each assumption. And those assumptions come out of your brain, that things that's really smart and it's really stupid because it's data is always outdated, right? And then you create new solutions. And that's physics, actually. Like he, he came up with a real concise, easy way to understand it, but that's the engineering approach in physics too. It's how the planet runs. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, so I always say like, yes, design approach and just remember it's better questions, questioning your assumptions. And again, impossible versus possible is only in your mind impossible because your assumptions are telling you it is. Mm -hmm. And so again, I go when I go into these corporations and we and we work on these things, I just hold the space for possible. And every time they launch impossible, then we go through and say, okay, it's impossible because let's look at the assumptions. Are the assumptions correct? Can we change the assumptions? Can we change the approach to make the assumptions no longer limiting factors? You know, mm. time, resources, money, all of that's in flux until it's not. Mm. And we kind of forget about that the world is that nice dynamic place and not a static place to solve things in. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the exciting thing about the world, right? I think it's also really, really important what you were saying about knowing your own values and knowing your own boundaries, because I think it's so interesting to see these entrepreneurs working so hard to like make their, their baby and their big idea happen. And they partnering up like all these VCs. And <laughs> then like at the end of the day, like, like their salary is like zero. <laughs> Yeah, and, and sometimes it's because the baby's ugly and no one tells us. <laughs> yeah. Like, seriously, I can tell well, you I am an idea creating machine and I am brilliant in my own universe. And I bless and thank everyone, including my husband, who's like the opposite personality type learning style for me, who just looks and goes, honey, baby's freaking ugly. <laughs> right like that's how we are as entrepreneurs it's my thing I'm gonna... and it's like yeah. sorry but your baby ain't gonna win any beauty pageants that's why it ends up being a zero right it's amazing yeah so I always yeah. I do an exercise with all my clients um it's one of the things I do when I do team building retreats is I actually and I got this from a really good friend of uh, mine who still works as a contractor in some of my courses named Carrie Williams and um she, it was like the baby is ugly exercise. So I literally say, okay, you have to look at him and tell him his baby is ugly. It is a homer. It's not going anywhere. And then, the, and it's like really hard to do, you yeah. know, and I have a picture of a really ugly baby, right? Like ugly by generic standards versus, you know, like adorable, right? Everybody's like, every baby's beautiful. So I'm not going to go in there guys. I'm not trying to trigger anyone about their baby. But the point is, we don't like to hear our babies ugly and people don't like to tell us and then we fail. So mm. the faster you can figure out, does everybody else think your baby's ugly and make the safe space for them to give you that feedback, the better your idea is going to evolve. Yeah, it's, it's going to save you a lot of time and energy, <laughs> like yeah. wasted time and energy in the long run as well. That's super interesting. Yeah. Um, so one thing that I'd like to draw out that you were talking about before, which is all about the importance of understanding people and empathy and, and like getting high performance to do well because you can't engineer a human being. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering what are some of the philosophy, philosophies, <laughs> what are some of the phil <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the philosophies that you you live by when communicating with people to get them to perform better and also when building relationships in general yeah so um we have a course that i i refer to the eight levels of leadership competence right and i just kind of dissected all the different things that make up a human so first and foremost um as a leader and as an entrepreneur the minute you judge someone as good or bad, their idea is good or bad, all that kind of stuff, you're in your dumb brain. So judgment's actually out of our limbic brain. And so the first thing when you say like empathy or patience, when I meet someone, 
you know, there's this really sick comment called you only get one chance to make a good first impression. And first impressions matter. They're true. No, they're not. They're BS. Why do we say that? I have people who I hated, my judge hated them on my first meeting of them. And I love and adore and they're best friends now, or they're people I'm doing business with now. And so the first thing about understanding another human being is whatever your judge says about them, just be like, thanks for that. Shut up. Get the data. What's your goal? What's their goal? Right? Because at the end of the day, we human beings connect at a higher level. It's called mutual goals, mutual things we want to accomplish together, shared values, right? And so when I meet people, when I used to like do interviews, I used to be like, you know, can you do this? Can you dot that? Can you cross the T on that? You know, and now I'm like, what are your goals out of life? You know, like I want to see what are your values when you get put in difficult situations? How do you feel about people who are like in this culture? The minute I see people who are not friends with someone else because they're an opposite political party, that's not going to be a good business person. Because guess what? We're naturally going to create balance. And so we're going to put one side and the other and then meet in the middle for balance. That's what human beings do. So I think that would be the first thing, you know, when we work with people on is like, no, you get, even though others may say you only get one chance to make a first impression, only stupid people do that. Mm. And so it's really, really important to make sure that you know that that's the case. Because like attracts like, but that doesn't mean you're attracting the right people to you. Second, Mm. you can take personality tests till the cows come home, right? Mm. All of them are only as good as the data on which they were based on. And you can, your brain, you can teach an old dog new tricks. That's another study, right? Till you're dead, you can grow new brain synapses. So even judging someone by their personality minimizes their humanity. So I, I, you know, when I teach personality typing because it's useful, I always teach it with the construct of this is how you all are relating now. This doesn't mean how there will always be or how you all will always relate. And mm-hmm. then the other thing where we fail miserably and we start in the school systems here in the States is learning. I learn differently than another human being. And they learn differently. And if you try to work with someone to create an idea, to create a, you know, a vacation or whatever, and you don't know how they learn effectively, I use seeing words. I'm a strong visual kinesthetic, right? Auditories need to have hearing words. You know, like I'm squinty. I got my hands. They're all above my shoulders all the time, right? So Mm. you know how I learn. I have employees and I have the exact opposite learning styles because a, I need them. I lost money in my business till I got an analyst. I'm an entrepreneur visionary, hired an analyst. So again, you got to pay attention to that. Um, And then the last one is, you know, if I could make anything mandatory in the school system, it would be teaching some basic psychology. So my second book that's coming out, You Can't Engineer Human. When my son was born and he had all these diagnoses that were just predicting his ultimate failure, it made me mad. You know, Mm. I was just like, he is beautiful, complete as he is. And you telling me he can only be X because of whatever these diagnoses you're giving me. No. And that's when I, that's when I started learning psychology is I was like, no, I don't accept these answers for him. And I'm glad I didn't because he's a wonderful, straight A, brilliant, you know, more emotionally intelligent than his mother human being that can, you know, make friends, function, and all the other things that they said he could never do, right? Mm. Um, But it's because with reverence, I learned to understand how gender, how we're raised, all those things that create this thing, you know, that has trillions of connections. Um. And so, you know, the second book was my labor of love and my devotion to my children, because it was like, once I realized how to uniquely nurture another human being for who they are, not who I want them to be, that's success. Mm. And so I always joke, you can't engineer human as my love letter to my kids, 
because they made me a better human being. They taught me how to uniquely see every person I have time with and coworkers and others so that I am in their space and I see them for all their complexity, which is wonderful. Instead of doing these simplistic stereotypes and labels and goofy things we try to do to simplify. That's really powerful. That's really powerful. It's it's almost like you're 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 accepting someone for who they really are and in doing so also encouraging them to be their authentic selves and yeah because once you get clear on how they want to work unless they're totally toxic people those you've got to get really good at just shoving out the door Mm -hmm. um most people even when they do bad things had good intentions Mm -hmm. you judge it as a bad thing because it impacted you negatively but at the time they chose to do something They thought it was going to pay off or they wouldn't have done it. We're really selfish. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Let's be frank. If you look at a child, anyone who says, child, they're so sharing and loving. I'm like, no. (laughs) We teach them to be sharing and loving. They're like yanking the sippy cup out of the other kid's hand and bonking him on the head to get the toy. (laughs) We're not not born unselfish. (laughs) Yeah. The the person who says that has probably never had children. (laughs) It's really interesting. Yeah, either that or was born with an angel child. I know they exist somewhere. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so something I'm I'm really curious about is I have heard that you have like very specific routines to set up your life for success that you take very yeah. seriously. And I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. So I was a very sick and ill human being in the early parts of my entrepreneurial journey, Um, which meant like I always pushed my body to the point of burnout or breakdown or negative relationships or other things. Um, I knew how to be successful and make money, but every other part of my life was always like, you know, and and then there was the big cleanup, right? And I think everybody has to uniquely figure out their thing. Like some people say four hour work week, you know, like there's all these little tools. Um, But I basically looked at it and said, everybody's different. So like you can have a read a book and be like, oh, and try it. Or you can read a book and fail miserably at it because it's not your thing. So I just want to give that construct before I tell what I do, because Mm -hmm. what I want to do is listening, say, create your own construct, right? as you are uniquely you and um, yeah. And I, and, and you're uniquely, you know, eight facets of you can't engineer certain parts of your humanity. You can honor them, expand them and grow them. Um, so for me, I do, I'm highly structured because um, I've been down the path of the entrepreneur, Jesus Christ, superstar martyr. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and so my first goal was to actually own my day, which is why every morning I don't start my day till I write my goals for that day. I uniquely look at every single day and decide because then I have criteria for when unexpected things happen to measure against and decide if I'm going to get sidetracked. Sometimes you do need to get sidetracked, you know? But other times you don't. Um, The second thing, I am very disciplined about what I eat and put in my body. You know, I had undiagnosed celiacs for years. Didn't even know I had celiacs until my thyroid failed. And um, and so, again, I just I was like, okay, if I'm an entrepreneur, entrepreneurs require high energy. If any of you entrepreneurs are sitting on this and you don't have high energy, You got to look first to your sleep, second to your food, and third to your mental fortitude, right? Mm -hmm. So I built into my day, I know what I'm eating. I stick around 20 to 30 grams of sugar. I only eat dessert on Fridays. Um, And then I have all sorts of other exercise, meditative. I start every day with a meditation, a guided visualization. I actually use a uh, app called Energy for Success. Um, some people love to meditate. Some people like guided visualizations. I'm a very active hyper person in a, in a, 
And so I can't stand to sit and meditate, but I love guided visualization. So that's the difference, guys. Like if you go to energyforsuccess.org and, and download theirs, they're like, they take you on journeys through the galaxies and bring you back home. That's me. Um, other people like mm -hmm. the meditation where you think about the drop and the drop and the drop. I tried those, didn't work for me. So again, choose, but you have to ground yourself. I set timers every 55 minutes because studies show your brain stops functioning at full capacity if you don't take a break every 55 minutes. Hmm. So I will stop myself and do, uh, you know, physical stuff. Um, I've used the work of um, Dr. Barry Morgan, uh, Shirzad, who did the Positive Intelligence PQ book, you know, like anything to break my momentum because realize, folks, the minute you're feeling force, fight, flight stuff, you're not in your your expansion brain that delivers on an idea. You're in your survival brain. And that's one of the things like my company's name is Thrival for a reason is because we normally get pulled into companies that are in survival. And I know they can never grow. They can never be global. They can never take that because survival is a pain brain. It's not the best place to be. And so when um, we renamed the company in 2012, I was like, I want it to be thrival because it's so important to distinguish survival and thrival thinking. So most of my day, folks, if I was to simplify it down to a nugget is to avoid me being in a survival state and making sure I'm in my best brain. So whatever structure that looks like for you, like just this week, I implemented no phone calls, no meetings before 1 p.m., and I'm heads down because I need quiet time. I'm an introvert. Mm. Other people who are extroverts do just fine with it, but not me. And then the afternoons, I do my all my meetings from one to five. You know, so so creating that construct, um, sleep yourself out. Like, does do you actually know how much sleep you need? It took me three mm. weeks to sleep myself out before I figured out it was eight hours. Yeah. And now that I get my eight hours, I wake up without my alarm clock every morning between five and five thirty. I don't need to set an alarm. Hmm. So, so really think about if you have these goals, all goals are based on how much energy you have to achieve them. And then the other um, constraint is I do a professional development course all the time. Every like I am never not in a course challenging my way of thinking. And I even tend to take things on that I would be like, ah, because engineers yep. do think a very specific way. <laughs> mm. We're only like think 12 or 15% of the planet from mindset. But, but yeah, I'm always um, seeking to learn more about the brain, more about what makes people tick and more about shutting my judge up so that even when I'm sitting in a room with someone calling me a very nasty word and threatening me, I get it isn't about me and I can keep that detachment and help them still create something. Because I do a lot of risk stuff and in the pandemic, people have acted kind of weird around certain aspects of <laughs> being locked down. And so again, um, and then there's one construct that kind of circles it all. I'm always asking, am I safe? Mm. We kind of forget that some people or situations aren't safe and we go into them thinking like we can walk into an unsafe thing and be safe. And that's usually where I have my biggest screw ups. Like one of my biggest failures of my 28 years just happened last year. Mm. You know, I got a phone call saying launch. We can't find PPE. Would you please become an auditor? Again, I used to do it in a past and find us global supply that's legitimate and bring masks to the United States. It was so not stacked in my favor. There was so much fraud. It was so gone. And I somehow thought I could audit enough and instead, you know, ended up in the worst business fiasco of my life because I was turning over all these people to these companies as uh, not legitimate. And then it turned out the companies were involved. Mm. Right. Like it, it was such a mess, you know, and yeah, I lost a lot of intense. money. And, I mean, the good news is none of my clients lost a penny, mm. but it was probably my worst. Uh, I had my in what? 18 plus years of business. I had my worst quarter ever last year in wow. what was supposed to be this amazingly lucrative thing. Yeah. You know? 
And so now I do ask, am I safe? Because when I looked around, I was like, I should have probably checked out a lot of these folks a lot better just because somebody wants to hire you and what says, oh, we want you to audit. We want you to find fraud does not mean that's true. Mm, definitely. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting because like often people have a gut instinct about something, but then they get caught up in the the opportunity or they start mm-hmm. to like, be like, oh, I'm being irrational, all these kinds of things. But you're gut yeah and my gut always told me something was wrong but I was with all these people and and very high up in governments and structures of organizations that I was like well these people sound like they want to do something good and who Mm. am I to not support that um but all that glitters is not gold you know and yeah if you don't feel safe look at it you know, Definitely. sometimes it's just you need some therapy to get over something that happened in your childhood. But most of the time, it's your radar saying, get the frick out. <laughs> That's why we stay in relationships too long. We stay in jobs too long. We stick with a bad idea too long is because we ignore that not safe. Yeah, r- really powerful. Sometimes the best move is just to cut your losses and move on. And yeah, um, yeah really powerful. Um, yeah. I think it's super interesting what you were saying about your rituals and your goals as well. Um, that energy management is so important. I think so many people underestimate it as well. It's really interesting. We have the same structure right now. I'm doing no calls or meetings before 1 p.m. and then the meetings after in the afternoon. Um, super interesting. Um, so before we wrap up, one one little thing I am curious about is Little Bird told me that you're a whiz at raising capital for ventures. <laughs> and you just suddenly managed to find money for all these things. And I'm wondering what your secret is. Okay. So first and foremost, I'm going to fess up. I've bootstrapped everything I've ever done for myself. Mm. Okay. Now, I love when someone hits me with a big idea of something they want to do. And I've worked with nonprofits and capital raises. I've worked with small business on capital raises. Um, Why I'm a whiz at it is what sometimes they don't get that I do is how to pitch it and put enough structure behind it that it's believable for someone to invest in it. Mm. Like the recipe to get a PE or a VC firm, uh, depending on which industry you're in or a bank or anyone else, it's not rocket science, but Interestingly enough, most entrepreneurs are really bad at it because they're visionaries. People who give you money are looking for certain things. And um, but the, the, the crossover, which is really cool, and this is where I think I'm successful and why when people get my help on stuff, I can get it for them, um, is that in the human brain, all decisions are emotional. Right. So I I talk about this in my book. If you get in an accident and it knocks out your emotional brain, you can't ever make a decision again. Mm. So even that banker, that VC, that PE that you're sitting across from, there is a secret piece called emotion. And at the end of the day, they'll look at all the data and they'll but their emotion will tell them it's okay to lend or give you the money. So, again, it goes back to safety and comfort. If you haven't figured out how to keep your investor safe and comfortable, then they're not going to give you their money. And you have to think of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. One of the reasons why I'm good at requesting money on behalf of others is because I can see and figure out where they are and speak Mm. that. And so I encourage everyone to, um, you know, part of the book, uh, that shoulder. Oh, my God. Love the reverse thing. <laughs> the Millions book. I talk about something called the OM, one minute mission message. Mm. To get a visionary to nail it in a minute, if I can get them to that minute, then I can get them to pass a pitch and get funded. Mm. Because you have to call it down to the essence of emotion plus data equals X. You know, and so I think that's something else, too, in the book. And if you guys are on Kindle, it's on it's free on Kindle Unlimited now. Uh, I I put it as the free thing. That's how come there's so many thousands and thousands of copies out there now. But figure that out, because literally we give them too much logic. And guess what? People buy on pain, gain, fear 
and only 10% of the planet on logic. Hmm. So you got to be really good at talking that way to anyone who would invest in your company. Definitely. I think that we talk. the thing that a lot of people forget is that human beings are completely creatures of, of emotion and mm-hmm. not of logic. And so getting people on the emotional level is what sells. Well, yeah. And even people who seem not that way, it was news to me as an engineer. I, I really did consider myself Spock on making decisions. And then when I was like, oh my God, all decisions are emotional. I'm just convincing myself using data, but I'm still using my emotion to make the choice. Mm-hmm. And it gave me a different approach even to pitching my own stuff because I was like, oh, so even oh, me, I think I'm making this rational data driven decision. Nope. At the end of the day, it was an emotion that said yes. Yeah. And you're just tricking yourself. You're just you're, you're just, just tricking yourself. Yeah. It's like when people say people buy an emotion and justify with logic later. Yep. Basically. Oh, yeah. Very yeah. guilty of that one. <laughs> awesome. Um, so the final question I have for you, Elizabeth, is what are three key truths about the entrepreneurial journey that you would share with a young entrepreneur today? Number one, you don't know shit. You're confident, but you don't know that. Alexa, stop. Sorry, that was the 12 noon. No um, so I went in with a lot of arrogance and I made a lot of mistakes on that arrogance, Mm. right? So assuming you don't have the answer, no matter whether you think you do or not, will save your bacon. Learn that 10, 15 years earlier than I did because we tend to be very confident, but that doesn't mean we're right. So I think Mm. that would be truth number one. Um, Truth number two would be, be really clear what you're willing to sacrifice and not because if you're not going into whatever you're developing and then the sacrifice hits and you did not choose it it's going to fail you know so if you said i'm going to do this and i'm willing to sacrifice and i might end up divorced because it's going to take 90 hours a week to do x by x and you haven't chosen you got to rationally choose what you're willing to sacrifice or not. And I, and I stress the, or not, because if there's one thing I've learned in my elder years is, um, I sacrificed a lot that I didn't have to. Hmm. So be really clear on where, where your lines are. And then I think my last truth would be commit to falling in love with every other human being on the planet in their unique space and place because you have no clue who the right people are on your journey. Mm. And check that judgment ship at the door, because like I said, I have people who I harshly judged, who ended up being some of the best supports for my launches, my dreams, my visions, my, when I failed pulling me out. Um, Yeah. So that third one's really important is if you don't love other human beings at the core of your core with empathy and patience and looking at them and evaluating them, but not judging them, um, you're going to have a lot of problems. You're going to be the hated leader. Mm, Really powerful. Yeah. Being, being open to the world, being Mm -hmm. open to people. It's really a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have so much support globally. If you'd asked me 20 years ago that I would have a friend to visit in every major country, that I would have business potential by just picking up phones, that certain governments would know my name. No, because I had already judged that none of that was possible or those people couldn't possibly be interested in little girls sitting in Texas doing X. Mm. Yeah, really powerful stuff. When you start getting the ball rolling, you start getting that momentum, all these opportunities start landing in your lap and it's you, you'll end up places that you never even imagined, which is yeah. a really beautiful thing. It is. And it's so much fun when you fall in love with the planet instead of worrying mm. about your peace. I love the word coopetition. I live it. There's yeah. We That's wonderful. And we can be competitive and it can still be win-win. So... That's, That's been beautiful. my goal with any business agreement I have with anyone is you may be a competitor on something, but maybe you don't have to be and we can cooperate and both win. Definitely. All about the win-win. 
Yep. That's super powerful. Thank you so much for your time, Elizabeth. Um, do you have anything that you'd like to plug to the people? Now is the time. Oh, you know what? And where can people I find am you? I'm so excited about my book coming out. And just, you know, between now and June 1st, because it's going to come out in the fall, I believe. I'll have to check with the publisher. Anyone who buys the book on Amazon gets to attend the um, course in the fall for free. Like I'm just going to do a big event. And so the book is based on this really powerful course I've been teaching for many years to help people have these transformations around their relationship with themselves and others. And um, yeah, for the bargain price of the book, man, you're going to get like something that would normally be a five ten thousand $10,000 weekend. Go do it. Do yourself a favor and it'll be virtual streamed. So if we can't get together in person in the fall, it's going to be online. We've already got the backup plan. Awesome. And where can people find you? Um, let's see. LinkedIn's really easy and that's my favorite place to play. So Elizabeth Dash Frisch, F-R-I-S-C-H on LinkedIn. Um, obviously, thrivalcompany.com, your corporate shrink.com, training that does not suck.com. Those are all brands under my uh, entrepreneurial umbrella and you can find me there. And then, um, obviously I just give out my email to people cause it's easy. Elizabeth at thrivalcompany.com. I was employee number one, so I got to keep my whole first name. Nice. Um, so yeah, so any of those things and, um, I would love to see you all. We've got so much cool stuff happening this year. So you can follow me on, uh, you go friend me on LinkedIn or I'm in Facebook too. And I'm pretty much in everything I think, but everywhere. I, but LinkedIn's, awesome. my, yeah. like LinkedIn's my workspace. So if, you, if you're if you on LinkedIn, if not, you know, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook and all the other places because I have a nice social media team who puts me out there. But um, my fastest response will be LinkedIn or email. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, uh, thank you for your time. This has been a bunch of fun and uh, really appreciate it. Oh, thank you.